All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out and, and joining online for the February meeting. Um, we have a very exciting show tonight. Um, I got a couple quick announcements that we're going to do show and tell. There's a very cool table up front here. Um, and we've got some great pictures online. Um, and then we have a panel that's going to do our skill session spectacular. Uh, these are experts from our own yeah. guests. Don't roll your eyes, you're all experts. I know you are. I don't want you to be modest. Uh, and so they're going to talk about a couple subjects that uh, were requested by the society. Um, and then we'll wrap up, and those who are in the room have an opportunity to win some uh, lovely plants donated by. Uh, uh, we'll be talking from Oakland, and we have some great looking stuff from Tiny Bible. So they're down in Daly City. If you're in there, reach out to them. Uh, you can find them online very easily. And uh, yeah. So, first off, we have several new members. Uh, so, welcome everyone. I, I don't know if you're all here. If you are, give us a shout. Uh, we have Reed Smith. Marty Appel, Patty Bond, Benjamin Heim, Tona Lay, Justin Tungate, Kevin Brenner, Alexander Mosier. Did I miss anybody else who's new? Oh, welcome. Oh, yes. Uh, Tim and Bonnie? Tim and Bonnie, thank you. Welcome. No. Oh, thank you, Evan. Welcome. All right. Uh, oh, we might have a little dates here. Um, but there's judging. There's judging in the next door. Um, that happens every week or every month during our meeting. Um, that old piece of that. Uh, by lonely judging, um, that's the third Saturday morning. Uh, and then the California Supreme Court Judge Center happens during uh, Cap Sacramento Orchid Society meetings, which was actually last week, but they'll have another one uh, next month. Sorry about the things. Um, other events, as I'm sure you're all aware, we have the 70th annual, annual Pacific Orchid Expo. That's going to be right here in just a little over two weeks. I'll be here in two weeks, so I'll be set up. I hope everyone's volunteered. I hope everyone's excited about these beautiful t shirts we've got. They aren't they? Yes, yes. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, I'm going in our yeah. name. You didn't you didn't put the shirts together. Well, I yeah, I did the business part, but Jonathan made it. So yes, get yourself a shirt, come out to the show, volunteer at the show. There's still opportunities to volunteer. Go to the website, sign up. Uh, we'd love to see you and love to have you. Um, you know, it's a community event, and we're all in this together. So. Um, there's also, we've got a display at Filoli. I think we've got some pictures of it later. Um, we still have opportunities to go down and hang out at Filoli and tell people about orchids, tell people about the show. Um, and you get in for the day, so you go in, you can sign up, it's through this Sunday, and we take it down on any morning. So I think they went, you went the day we set it up on Monday, right? Yeah, I, I went on. So you check in at the front desk with your name tag. It's inside the historic palace in the kitchen. And they really mostly need you there from like 11 to 2 is when most of the traffic occurs. And then, yeah, once you're in, especially if you have someone to relieve you, it's fine to walk off and like go check out the ground if it's not creepy, but they're not in shape. But um, it, it's fun. It's a beautiful building, beautiful garden. I did last year. Um, some people just walk through and they're like, oh, that's pretty. Uh, some people are really excited and want to know all about it. If you got a chance to talk about it. So, yeah. so let us know if you're going to go. We have a packet with like <coughs> to help you talk to people. About things. And those cards to hand out. Yeah. Um, we also have um, people who want to show off your growing space. Um, and you want to have some people over, it doesn't have to be you know, the whole society. Um, we will accommodate the size that you want to have. Um, but reach out to us. Um, we'll tour things that we're doing that 
they did one a couple weeks ago and it seemed to go really well. So uh, that's something fun. Uh, oh, yes, this is what I just mentioned. Here's the flyer. We'll see you all soon. Um, other events. Next Monday, we've got the combination board and show committee meeting. That's the last one before the show, so won't be could be lots to go over. Uh, next month, we're going to have Carol Colossi talking about Romania. Um, and then coming up soon is uh, board nominations, the May meeting. We're going to uh, elect a uh, new board president, everybody. Uh, so show up for that. Let us know if you want to get involved. So, Lots of chances to get involved here. Um, Tom Berlini is also teaching a course on growing orchids through City College. Um, still sign up. Uh, I don't know how full it is, but the website will still let you sign up. So reach out. Tom's going to give a great lesson. Well, actually, on Zoom or in person only? It's in person only. It's like, I think it's like, Thursdays for six weeks or something. Yeah. Yeah. Thursday is the next. Is it a day class or after hours? No. Day it's, it's a day class. It's like yeah. 10 to four or something. So. Two, something like that. If you can go, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, so that's that. Now, uh, show and tell. I think we'll get started here with uh, this beautiful table that's in front of me. Uh, so I'm going to ask Mr. President Jeff to help me here. He's going to be a photographer. He's going to be a You just have to speak up. Start with yours. I don't know. It looks like. Share share the screen. We're working on it. We're just slow. <laughs> okay. A little slow. So I have logged in as Adam. If you want to see me as a member, you can go there. Uh, we've got pinned in the big room, and you'll see the video as I take a look at these plants. Where do we start? I don't know. Do a close up so you can see the little flowers. Okay, this is my Dyneema polybalbon. Um, as you can see, it's been growing. We can't while. see anything. <laughs> oh, don't, don't, uh, look at, it's not a pin one. You have to go look for his name. Adam. Adam. Just look for Adam. Look at Adam. Yeah, we, we, can't, so we can't see it. Uh, we need to have a screen share. We are not sharing. Look for Adam. <laughs> Well, she's looking at us, not the Yeah. No, 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 no. Look for Adam on the people that are signed in. Top at the very top, or however you've got it set, Adam is the one that we be show. You know, we're looking at his uh, screen, so look at look for Adam. 
Can you see the big green uh, flowers there? It should take over the screen. You know, like, well, no, no ma'am. All, no, all I can no. see is the, is the screen in the room, which of course is. Uh, yes, yes, that's not the right one. Look for Adam. And you can see a, a polybulbon right now in the middle of the picture. Can you see all the people who are participating? All the little squares. Oh, under participants. Yeah, so you look for Adam. Don't share that. Don't share it because it's going to put you in a circle. That's going to be a big mess. We see it, but it's very yes, small. I understand. What you, you can, Adam? Oh, right. Yes, what you do is you right click on, on Adam and it will give you a menu. One of them is. Got it. Got it. Yay. Okay, we're going to go. Right clicks here. Now it's nice and big. Okay. Are we are we good now? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> what what do we need? Let's carry on, guys. We have a lot. Just go. <laughs> okay. Well, this is my um Polly Bulbon. And as you could guess, Polly Bulbon means many little bulbs, which it certainly has. It's been growing for a long time in an intermediate greenhouse, and it fortunately wasn't too stuck to the bench. They will be gathered out. Um, this is seems to be Dendro season. A lot of them are blooming now. This is my Smithiana. Dendro Kylons are mostly from the Philippines or close by, Southeast Asia. So they grow. This is well, there are places in the Philippines that are cool growing, so they can get a range of, of growing environments. Um, I'm going to go to that. That's epidendron lot card yoides. Uh, the, the suffix yoides means like, so it looks like a lot card, yeah, which has that very braided pattern to the leaves and these very peculiar flat green flowers. Um, this is my LC canariensis. It's a Primary hybrid. And the canariensis means from the Canary Islands, which it isn't. So I don't understand why it was named that. What's this canary color? Yeah. <laughs> but, but the Canary Islands are named for the color you would name for dog, Canaria. So it doesn't make any sense. But that but whoever named it in 1906 named it that. Um <coughs> This came to me from Fred Clark and LC Rojo, which it absolutely is not. Rojo means red, and LC Rojo is a very red plant, red flowered plant, which is what I want. So I don't know what this is. Put it on the raffle taste. I'll sell it. I'll sell it to you. <laughs> Um, this is my Prostachia fiddlina. The Prostachias are Mexican species. They like a dry rest. Um, the fiddlina means yellow yolk, which must mean the lip on this, which is quite yolk colored. And um, does that always bloom in the winter for you? Is this winter now? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it spring? Isn't it spring? <laughs> it's spring somewhere. I, I think things are blooming um, sooner than they used to. I think it's warmer. All right, well, let's, let's do this. this is, here is a, uh, oh, this is Zygopetalum neon blue. Oh, this is this is Kathy Pedalum with the Lowsome from Mitch Schneider. Actually, I think the DM Blue was Mitch's too, was it? Yes, yes. Yeah, name on that one. Okay, this this is Kathy Pedalum with Um It's absolutely gorgeous example of a species. These will grow outdoors in the Bay Area. Oh, 
Jack Frost. Jack Frost. Is it Zygopella? Zygonaria. Zygonaria. Jack Frost. Are you, are you spraying it? The zygos are usually over. Zygonarias aren't because an ACS idea is a breaker, and the zygonaria is dominant on a breaker. The zygonarias are zygon. So, uh, but an ones are really great. But an ACS idea is not the blue okay. parent. Okay. You gonna sell those at uh I have seedlings, yes, yeah. available to POE. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a pretty yellow thing. Let's see if I can find a check for it. Tell the sunrise. Well stick well sticky arrow, right? Yep. Celtic sunrise, very pretty. The complex migraine. Well, it drove cool in the Bay Area. Well, yeah. Sticky arrow sometimes do. Sometimes, yeah, this one grows just fine in Half Moon Bay in the greenhouse. Unheated? Currently. 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 Is it is it Baptistonia BST? It is also tarantula. The final name was sweet orange. Yeah, they changed that. It's actually Brassistelle tarantula. Okay, just say it louder. Brassistelle tarantula. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So not not any losses at all. No, that's the tag from last year. Which is like, like, <laughs> they it changed it since then. It, yeah, and and you are so this is your plan. Yeah, it's Vincent. Vincent, okay, thank you. Did you say it's tarantula? Yeah, yeah tarantula. It has this nice spidery. Um, yeah, which is I'm assuming why they did Okay, here's my Miltasia. Uh, Charles M. Fitch with the clone name of Kazumi. It's a primary hybrid between Brassica, Custom, and Montgomery's Hectabolus. Upside down, too. I don't know why it's going that way, but it is upside down. No. <laughs> Um, Gloria Justin brings us Craig, Professor Brain. Is that correct? Brain. Brain. Looks like a, a hybrid of several different Craig species. So here's a beautiful saponitis. Gloria brings us saponitis xanthoblossom by coxinia. Or is it coxinia? I think it's coxinia. You know, it was the tag yes. was tagged yeah. by yeah. museum. It's by actually it's not as red as the So it's it yellow on the lips. It's beautiful, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a shutter. Okay. Uh, here's Gloria's uh, Pyrothalus ornata. Oh, they have like those are the other on white. Actually, it looks like earrings. They have like little white strands. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And all, Gloria also brings us Montevalia, <coughs> Behar's Beckles. Yeah. With these little lavender flowers. I don't see speckles. Sort of in the middle. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Exercise. 
And this is this is Gloria's Stellis Morganii, which is a whole lot of flowers for a Stellis. <laughs> Yes. 
have a very nice table today, and we have a number, we have actually 26 plants on uh, the virtual show and tell. There you go. There's a black thing in the middle. Of it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's gone. Okay. All right. So, um, what do which button do I push to advance? Oh, just space. Okay. All right, we also have a very nice virtual show and tell. We're starting with Deborah Bale's quartered uh, prolific dendrobium that we somehow missed last time. Uh, this looks to me like a Kingianum type dendrobium, which are great plants for the Bay Area. You can put them outside, they'll do fine. They're, they bloom better if you don't water them much in the winter, but I forget mine bloom anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> So, the space bar is not doing it. Okay, no. Which one? I just want to get arrow. All right. Um, next is Deborah's LSERI Hilo Ablaze Hilo Gold which is a clone of a plant that got an HCC from the AOS. The LSERs are a complex hybrid of Camisa, Brassia, and Miltonias. They have these gorgeous colors in three inch flowers. They require kind of medium growing conditions <laughs> and uh, are pretty faithful bloomers. <laughs> Oh, skip one. Oh, the other yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Here's my um Deborah's <coughs> Monsevalia angulata, which is made named after an angle somewhere in the lip that has a sharp angle to it. They're from the cloud forest areas of the Andes in Colombia and Ecuador. They grow fairly shady and um, in a range of temperatures. Isn't that a Sorry? Sorry? It is. It is. It is. I could be. Okay, the next, the next one is Deborah's beautiful Cymbidium. She doesn't have a tag on this, so if anybody knows the uh, species name, she would like to know. Well, it's a Cymbidium, that's the species name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the name no, Cymbidium says genius. Oh, sorry. So, uh, and uh, Cymbidium actually means boat organ, named for the shape of its lip. And there are 86 species of cymbidiums, mostly from Asia and the Pacific Islands. There's one or two in Australia as well. Oh, and the red thing, in case you're interested. So she thought it was interesting that it had a cluster of these dark red flowers in the middle of the stem of the gold ones. And she thought it was like some bizarre culture thing. So Tom Verlee was there when we were setting up and he told me to put them on. It, not because it's a disease, but when the pollen caps get either moist or damaged physically, the, they, the flowers- well, Where is it? Where is it? So, so it just so you're aware, she asked about that. Any okay, here's here's the Smiths, one of our new members sent us some pictures for show and tell. This is Spadicelli umbellata, named for its little umbel of red flowers that look like a raspberry. It's from Colombia and it likes to grow fairly warm. <clears throat> Here's Reeves Lelia Lilliputiana, which is named because it's a small flower, Lilliputian. Um, 
Pardon? That's spelled. It doesn't mean it's actually that's a bad word. That's part of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled in Italian to that word. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Anyway, they're from um, Minister Reyes in Brazil. They're one of the meticulous Lelias and one of the smaller ones. They have a, a range of color from the color we see here to a little more intense lavender. <laughs> here's, here's Larry Roberts, Zygo Petal and Blue, blue black Blazes, Barry Ford. Um, there, it's a complex hybrid of four different Zygo Petal and species. It gets about Flowers of about three inches and can grow in a range of ten inches. Here is Jeff's LC Halapa, Florence Lynn, which got an AM AOS crossed with um, Gracia Catlia Makai Leah, also an award winning parent. This, this plant has a, it's a complex hybrid with at least eight different Catlia species in its background. It would, likes to grow in good light and can grow, isn't too fussy about the temperature. Where did you grow it, Jeff? I had it in the greenhouse. Unheated, right? Uh, no, it's heated. Okay, so it, this one likes it warmer, obviously, because it's moving nicely. Here's Jeff's uh, Dendrobium regal vista, which is a complex hybrid made by Fred Clark of five different <coughs> dendrobium species. A bunch of us got these. So we got we bought a, a flat of these for orchids in the park and gave some on apple tables. So I told you the clone number because there's four clone numbers. Uh, and I don't know if the larvae will look like this or not. So when there's blooms, if you got one, let's see if they look all the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. And here are two of Jeff's Bellinopsis. The Sogo Vivian is the one on the left with the striped flowers and the variegated leaves, which is always a prized thing. There are, when I was looking, it looked like there were at least 50 different Sogo something Phalaenopsis. So that obviously was a very good parent. And then the, the other one is little strawberry. So good is the parent. It's a, it's one of the well, the one of the hybridizers in Taiwan. So they need to stay in the greenhouse. Oh, so it's not the same background. It's, it's, it's not the hybrid. It's it's uh it's okay. a it's, it's a, a grow. So yeah. he, he named a bunch of different, totally different things. Yeah, uh, yeah. Everything, everything starts with that's yeah, yeah, there are at least 50 uh, different phalaenopsis that start with so yeah. yeah, but so they don't necessarily have the same. No, they parents. are wildly different parents, but they all come from the same breeder. Oh, it's like, thanks for <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, this one has about six different phalaenopsis in its background. And um, phalaenopsis is a genus of about 83 species from East Asia uh, and the Pacific and also Australia. And these now, I think the, the Sogo flowers are a little bigger than the little strawberry, but they're about an inch and a half to two inches. Is that yeah, seem strawberry. accurate? Yeah. Thank you. And they have these little picotees. That yeah, little... Pic picotee means the more, a, a different color on the edge. On the margins. <coughs> Sorry? The species behind the really breast is real stage questions and the picket means something like that. Roberta Fox sends us a, her epigenium clementiae, which actually is now called Dendrobium mariae. <laughs> it grows on tree trunks in Southeast Asia. And 
I'm assuming that that uh, Roberta grows this on her deck in Southern California. Outside. Outside. Okay. Goes outside in Southern California. Costa Mesa, right? Yeah, Costa Mesa. And here's uh, Roberta's Leptodes Harry Phillips CI, <laughs> which is named after Harry Phillips, who is Andy's brother. It's another one of the Lupiculus lelius from Brazil. It has about a one inch flower. Yeah, I jump in here. And I repeat this lelius. Leptodes, uh, it, for a while, it was a, considered a uh, a synonym of Poloensis, but just very recently I checked on Q and it is now considered a valid species, but it's also outside and grows pretty bright. Okay, yeah, there are nine, I, I made a mistake, it's not a meticulous. It, there are nine species of Leptodes from Brazil. And here's Roberta's Maxillaria saponitis. Um, saponitis means modest or small. Uh, the flowers on this are maybe three quarters of an inch, but it gets a whole lot of flowers. And it's from Northern Venezuela. It grows on the edge of the cloud forest there and it can grow cool to warm. Which plant? Yeah. Here's Roberta's Ophris critica, or perhaps it's Ariadne. Um, the Ophris are known as the bee orchids because the inside of it looks like a bumblebee and is pollinated by bees that think it's another bumblebee. <laughs> um, they're from the South Aegean area and they grow in anywhere from full sun to shade. The Ophris, I just found out, Ophris needs eyebrow, and it's because somebody thought the hairy lip inside looked like an eyebrow. <laughs> this is my tridactyly tricuspis, uh, which ba basically means 3-3. Three, three. I circled the end of one of the lips there so you could see the three prongs, which is how it got its name. It's from South Africa and grows in the forests there. Uh, here's some pictures from Tololi to uh, those of you that haven't been to go down there. Here's Tom Pickford's giant dendrobium speciosum. This is a plant that uh, takes a while to get big, but it gets really big. Um, speciosum means extremely beautiful. And they're from Southeast Australia, grows on rocks or in open forest. This is Susan Anderson's Dendrobium wow. <laughs> tenella. Tenella means very delicate. And um, it's another one of the, the dendrocolons from the Philippines, from the mountains in the Philippines. It grows up at 3,300 to almost 5,000 feet. It can grow cool to warm, and uh, dendrocolons are close relatives of selogenes. Here's another one, Pulcherimum, Pul which means very beautiful. This one's from Luzon in the Philippines, and it grows at about 3,600 feet. Here's Susan's dendrobium teridifolium. Um, which is named after the shape of its leaves. Terid terid means cylindrical. Did someone have a question? Okay. Uh, <laughs> It's also from Eastern Australia. It's epiphytic. It grows at low, ele low elevation. Here's Patty Bow's Catlia intermedia cerulea. One of the Catlias from Brazil in the coastal forests there. Um, 
Intermedia means medium. Um, but this this plant can have flowers four inches big, which doesn't seem very medium to me. <laughs> Here's Patty's Cycnokes. And here are more pictures of the Cycnokes. It's Cycnokes and Catherine Berger, Roswood Worcesterwitzii. Uh, it has its own name now. It is Cycnokes Willie Gonzalez. And uh, the Cycnokes like bright light and a very severe rest in the winter. Here's my Ornithocephalus. I don't have a species name on this. And uh, the Ornithocephalus go in Central to South America. There are 55 different species, and they have these fan shaped um, leaves and no, with no pseudobulbs. My Mysticidium gracile, one of the leafless orchids, although they can get a few little leaves at the top. The ceiling means delicate or graceful. They're from Madagascar, Madagascar and South Africa. They go up at five to 6,000 feet. And then finally, we, might ha we have my Solanidiopsis tigroides, which the species name doesn't seem to exist anywhere online. But it seems appropriate given the colors, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, there are only three Solanidium species. They're from the northern part of South America and close, closely related, related to Oncidium. This one I grow outdoors. It blooms regularly for me and it smells like honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's it. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, that was one of those tour of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when she gets to do the research on the stuff, we've got the slides. I know it's fun looking up this stuff. But you also did a great job going through everything okay. that you Oh, I, I did want to say, I did want to credit. I have a book called um, Orchid Orchid Names and Their Meanings by Helmut Helmut Rohr, I think. That's just a great reference book. And yeah, use that. I also use Orchid Wiz and J. Paul's Internet Encyclopedia along with the Hey, that book still in print. A crucial question for great Orchid books. Is it still in print? The, the Orchid names? Yes. No, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you how oh, I got mine. Really... I, I got mine off of eBay. I had to pay $50 for it, and whoever sent it to me didn't even have the good grace to take off the label that said unclaimed luggage $3. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it's a wonderful book. I really like it. Okay. Um, great. Well, now we're going to transfer into the skill session. Um, just a little overview of how we got here tonight. So if you all remember the new math as well, uh, back in September and October, we did a little poll to see what subjects people were interested in learning more about. Uh, the top three things people wanted to know about were uh, orchid, knowledge, orchid knowledge resources, like out of print books, um, <laughs> uh, pros and cons of different potting media and pot types, and then uh, some information about repotting orchids. Um, so I was able to get to convince uh, five of our members here to uh, to come in and talk. Hello, hello Mishi's here. Um, so I'm going to invite our, well, we have uh, Bill, Florence, Jeff, Mishi, and Mitch will all come up um, and they'll regale us some of their wisdom. And then in a little bit, uh, yes, okay. Uh, Gloria um, reached out because she's been doing some experiments with um, sustainable potting material and she wanted to share with us some of her experiments. Um, so she'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll get our experts to uh, weigh in on, on what she's playing with. Um, first thing I wanted to show though is that 
you know, do you want ORCID resources? We have a page on the website of ORCID resources. Um, you can go check that out. Um, there's a long list of things. Um, we go to it right now. Uh, so there's waiters, ways to reach out to us. We've got a list of ORCID organizations, and then there's all these resources. So you can explore that. And I, the first question I'm going to ask our experts is what they think of these various resources. What's their go-to? Uh, Gold Coast Symbidium Society has a page up that has uh, where to buy the supplies, which is the biggest problem we have. So we got labels, plots, plants, spades, charcoal, fertilizer, eco rolls, all that sort of stuff on Gold Coast Symbidium Gold Coast Symbidium Society dot org dot org. Uh, but it has there to get all this stuff. Gold Coast. Gold Gold Coast Symbidium Society. There's a page in there that shows where to get some of the supplies. It's getting harder and harder to find some of this stuff. I'm, I've been searching for pots, but I need to buy them by the case. Right now, they, they were in quality back. Bill, do you want used plastic pots? No. Oh. Uh, I, I don't have the time to clean them. I've got a stack of used ones that I'm never going to get. I, I have a stack. And then Gold Coast, for those people who grow some videos, on the same um, website, there is an article by one of our members who talks about potting, repotting civilians. And I will be bringing a bunch of papers so that you can go to the POE and go to the top for repotting civilians. You'll get that. And you'll get this also. So repotting civilians. Do you, uh, do you know if they who carried Orteod? Hi, uh, uh, you're uh, supplier for the Bay Area, right there. Okay. Hello. 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 Mitch Schneider. <laughs> And he will, um, if you call him, he's got, I don't know if he has your card. I think he has the card with me. He has cards. You can call him on his phone. Yeah. And he's on, and half one day. So you can get your Orpheata for him. Are you, are you also carrying um, the precision? The precision? Uh, I can order precision. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't use it. I've actually switched over to small stuff to, we'll talk more about it, but I switched over to a lot of the smaller stuff. I actually don't use moss anymore. But it's slightly more acidic and it keeps too wet in our California climate. So I've actually switched over about 90% of my breeding stock to New Zealand tree, New Zealand tree ferns because it is pH neutral, which means it can grow past and it also uh, doesn't decay for it doesn't decay for 10 years. So for plants that like to stay in the thing, slip plotting is beautiful. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over. No, that's just it. That's part of our talk. So there's a lot of ORCID forums on the website. There's a couple, at least that I go to. I go to ORCID board forum. They're pretty good. Is that the name of the company? I'm ORCID. sorry? The name of the company is? It's not a company. It's a forum. It's ORCID forum. board, board forum. Dot com, I think. You can always, if you Google it, you just say ORCID forums, and you will find some. Some are better than others. Yes. So you have to kind of take a look at who uh, will be on it. Roberta, who is uh, a participant here and brings plant, uh, shows plants. She's on the ORCID board forums. And so she can, um, and she will put in her, her little bit of information of what people are asking about. Um, well, one, one caution too, whenever looking up anything on the internet, <clears throat> if anybody says the only way it can grow this plant is this way, <laughs> the, the only way they can grow it is a specific way because if you know, your environment is different from her environment, which is different from mine, which is different from yours. Yes. To everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. So if somebody says, "Oh, you have to put it outside." Well, if you're in Boston, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> so, if you're in Marina del Rey, hey, it's fine. That's that's the old joke: is what works for you works for you. Bill and I are Bill and I are ten minutes away, yeah. and I, and Bill and I have to grow 
completely differently yep. because we're on different parts of, of Half Moon Bay. So, yep. and we and I could throw a stone and probably hit Bill. Yeah, <laughs> we were just comparing temperatures just so far this year. He's been four degrees colder and like 10 degrees hotter just this year wow. since January. Yeah. I had a 31 night and an 89 degree day. That was my day max for 24 hour period. And we're literally around the corner. He's on 92. I'm on highway one. Uh huh. Uh huh. And the other. Um, the next was important that day. Yes. The next was important that day. The next was important. The other um, um, St. Augustine Orchid Society, Augustine, I guess, in Florida, they're pretty good. Sue Barham, who um, regularly contributes to that and to the uh, AOS, yeah. she's a fountain of information. So uh, those are the ones that I like going to. Some of the other ones I look at and I'm going, oh, they're not potting with gloves. They're not talking about the virus. I'm going, oh, okay, I'm gone. So you just, you really have to um, join the societies here where there's a lot of people who are more concerned about cleanliness and, and other growing ways. Um, you'll learn a lot more. And then when you go on the websites, you will quickly find out which is the best thing. But um, like Bill and Mitch said, where you live depends on how you grow and what type of media you use. I live in Oakland. I did live in San Francisco. And so it also depends on how much rain you get, how much you like to water. Some yeah. people don't want to water. So you have to use a different type of media. Um, changes your fertilizer too. Yeah, and it oh changes my. your fertilizer. So there's a lot of things you have to decide if you want to figure out what type of potting media you use. Media is not soil. That's the first thing you want to know. Don't yeah. plant in soil. Although I talked to somebody the other day who has his semeniums in soil. I've heard about that. Yeah. I, well, I so, told one guy that was impossible. He could never do it. Turns out, and, and where it always boils down to when you potting mix is it's always about drainage, right. getting air into the mix. So the guy was growing in literally potting soil. He kept them on his back porch. In the winter, they got no water at all. In the summer, once a month. So, okay, it's going to dry out enough for the roots to survive. But if you took that same plant, put it outside in the backyard, five feet away, it would have died in the winter because it would have stayed too wet. It's just all a matter of you're in charge of the, the watering. Uh, Frank Fordyce used to have a glass brick full of marbles and he had a cafe to grow in it. Hmm. World's best drainage, but he had to water it twice a day. Again, and Rennie. and shameless plug for our society as, as Adam has shown you the website. There is an orchid doctor. Ask an orchid doctor. Some of us, um, some of us do get yeah. There he is. There he is. Call the orchid doctor. I also get those emails now. So there is there is people that will answer them as well. So sh uh, shameless plug for those that are in our society meeting. Don't feel free to use it. One of us. I at least I look at that email list uh, every Wednesday. So, so peek behind the curtain a little bit. So, until recently, Orchiata, which is New Zealand redwood, redwood. It's it's actually Monterey Monterey pine, which which we get from New Zealand, which I think is hilarious. It's hilarious because it's grown here. But yes. what they've done is that they grow it sustainably. So well, they chop it down and they. They plant more. Well, the, right. idea, the idea was they were planting it like we planted eucalyptus to get telephone poles, which didn't work. Um, they planted it for paper pole, which works great, but they have those leftover bark. And what they do with the orchiata and to a degree with kiwi is they compost it because we we used to get all this great fur bark for years. This was the thing, fur bark, pure fur bark. But what happened is one, we discovered cogeneration, which meant when you cut down the tree, they burned the bark to run the mill. So it went from being a waste product to something they needed. And they also got rid of old growth forest. So we started getting the new bark and it was full of chunks of wood and it would break down really fast and it was garbage. So now what they're doing with this, the orchiata, they take it out and they compost it. And all the little bitty bits that normally would rot away Right away, 
and they sift all that stuff out and you get the good hard chunks left that last for years. That's why we're using it. Two and a half years is what yep. it goes to. Yep. Good stuff. How's the orchiata different from the kiwi part? Uh, orchiata has um, added minerals. I think it's calcium. And, and well, they put calcium in it. You can see why they're white dusting on it, uh, basically to stop the composting. Um, there's an argument of which way it's going to go, whether or not it's going to rinse out. I think it's going to rinse out. It rinses out. But I figure I'm going to. I'm going to make a, a sample and try it one of these days. The biggest issue from my perspective is orchiata tends to be chunks like this. Uh, kiwi bark tends to be little flakes. Now, if you don't properly put drainage material around it, in my view, it tends to pack up. And you get kiwi bark in things almost have itself in the Kiwi also right. isn't the composted, and those trees are naturally waxy as well. Right. So when if you it's use if you use kiwi especially on smaller seedling plants. You have to water it heavily for probably the first year until it, until it breaks down enough to the point where it will start water. absorbing water because that waxy coating will just wick all the water away. Yeah. And it's fine if you're growing massive, huge adult hatlias, right. kiwi works fine. If you're growing window seal plants, Good luck watering it every four times a day till that thing roots in. And then, and but basically, the people there's there's kind of how should I say? There's fight, fight, fighting words because some people are Love total it. fans of orchiata, some are total fans of. Yeah. I played with both of them. I fell on the side of uh, uh, orchiata, orchiata Pomperides, orchiata Ken yeah, Jacobson, Kiwi. Kiwi. Bob yeah. Hamilton's also Orchiata, but there's it's pockets. And, right. and Fred Clark is um, you know, he's a real advocate. Yeah. Oh yeah, big yeah. time. Yeah. So but, the other thing about Orchiata does come in different sizes. Yeah. So that's one thing you you know, depending on what you want to grow your plants in and the root structure, then you use the seedling bark, which is really really tiny. Really and kiwi comes in all different sizes. Yes, right. six sizes. Sizes. Yeah, six sizes. And then you match it to what you're going to be growing. The bigger the pot, the bigger the chunks usually. And you've been. Carl. Orchidata is treated with calcium carbonate to adjust the pH. Yep. In Oakland, where they adjust the water to 8.5, yeah. so the pipes don't dissolve, I cannot grow anything in Orchidata. How long does it take for that to essentially break down and wash out? Or it's dead by then. It doesn't have any roots. So that's fine because I can grow my submidiums in Orchidata and Yeah. I had, I put pads in Orchidata and if you're later, I have a single root on it. Use oyster shell. It will absorb the pH. That's what we use for the paths, at least for that. It, it, oyster shell is even higher. Right. I put oyster shell in my uh, submidium mixes because I'm lazy and as it gets more acidic, it starts to dissolve. Right. What's your, what's your water? Uh, it's fairly neutral, but it's got so many salts in it. That's the least of my pH is the least of my worries. Yeah. I got 450 parts per million, and then I add fertilizer. So I like the, watering with seawater. Yeah, one of the things that's really important, again, is what Carl is talking about, is checking the source of your water. If you can look it up, you know, East Bay Mud, and they'll tell you how much the, the pH is, what the how much minerals are, and everything else. So you can adjust your mix to that. Um, it's it's something that's really important because I think mostly in the Bay Area, much of our, our water is alkaline and a lot of yeah. some, some yeah, salivate and some of the things your salt goes up. Yeah. yeah. So if there's you know there's things you gotta check if you really have some very sensitive plants to those types of salts. But the other thing is too is when you're fertilizing You've got to take at least one time a week, a month or a week, to rinse. just to rinse with just regular water, no fertilizer, so that you can flush out everything out. So it's, I think, I don't know how Bill and Mitch do, but I fertilize three times out of the month, and on the fourth week, I flush everything out. I'm too lazy for that. Uh, <laughs> I do have concentration. My greenhouse. Yeah, uh, my greenhouse, I, everything's on a sprinkler system. Well, okay, the Hackman Basic greenhouse on sprinkler. Everything at home is manually watered, but I subscribe to the weekly, weekly approach. Yeah. You, my basic tenant is the plant was growing on a tree. 
And whenever it rains, a little bit of dirty water washes over the roof. So it gets a little bit of fertilizer every time. So I have my fertilizer injector to put in about 100 parts per million nitrogen and everything else comes along with it every time I water. So every time I water, they get just a little bit of fertilizer. And I've, and I've also found and supplemented, especially for the soft leaf orchids, we're talking about mm -hmm. Sit and I've had a seed them. Yeah. It is extremely crucial to add calcium and magnesium. We were not yeah. doing that about a year. I switched over to using the CalMag 15515, mm -hmm. and the size of my catacetum grows this year uh, two and a half times of my on and I triple. So if you have soft leaf orchids, crucial also for the hard leaf orchid, your cat is, but if you're growing zygos, cymbidiums, uh, so the softer leaves, you need CalMag. Remember, the middle of the um, of the of the uh, of the of the chloroplast in the leaf is magnesium. So if you're not getting that, they won't produce as much chloroplast. What? Because in your water. Oh wait, you've got we've got city water up. You got yes, I got city water. Yeah, we got city water. They, we got well water, so I don't have to add. I got calcium. better water than you. Yeah, got, got better water, water than you. I don't have to add calcium or magnesium because the water is full of it. But he's got basically not quite hetch hetchy water, but very pure water. And it doesn't have the minerals that plants need. So you have to pay attention to what's in your water and add what's not there. Round of applause for Florence for doing the mediating role between <laughs> Bill and I. So the other thing, besides using, using orchiata or the bark, yep. yeah. most people will add perlite. Yep. Perlite is this volcanic stuff. Also called sponge rock. Or sponge rock. And most people will get, you can add nurseries, you get the little tiny stuff, which isn't all that great when, you, when you're growing. Because um, the roots will it down. So you want to get it at the hydroponic stores. Number two, perlite, and, um, which is really nice, which I forgot to take one part either, but that's, I knew Bill was going to bring this. It goes all the way down to that. Yeah. And for the Catlias and some of the other things, I use number three or number four. Yeah, number so four for Catlias. Yeah, number four for yep. Catlias. The thing about getting it at the hydroponic stores, yeah, is that everybody, it's a four cubic bag. So if you know people and you don't have that many organs, you got to go in with other people. To, otherwise, you'll have it for a long time. That doesn't matter to you. <laughs> Four cubic feet. It's about this big and about that big around. <laughs> or you can get it from your local commercial people. I also sell cat. <laughs> if you don't need a lot, get it. Buy, buy, buy okay, so what what does perlite do for your mix? Why is it aeration? Right. Yeah, if you aeration. think of it this way, you want the water again. I'm talking about air at the roots. What it does is it gives a little elbow room between your bits of potting mix. Yeah. So if you've got you know bark in there or something like this, and you put something like this in there oh, oh excellent i've got a mix so they can actually see through that she's got a mix here with the the darker stuff is the organic material that holds the moisture it holds your fertilizer and it has what they call calcium ion exchange where it a lot it holds the fertilizer and gives it to the plant but if you just filled it full of that material it would stay wet so what you have to do is you add perlite or some other aggregate to allow the drainage to go down between the components. Now, the thing to remember is you look in here, you see a lot of perlite. The reason is perlite is a mechanical thing. It's not like adding a little fertilizer. You can't add 2% of perlite to it. If you did, who cares? It's not going to do anything. You want enough perlite so that the water can get between the grains of perlite to get out. And more importantly, when the water drains out, the air can come in. So just adding a little sprinkle of fertilizer, awesome. A little sprinkle of perlite, <clears throat> why bother? And another reason why we use larger grain normal sponge rock for there is that over time, those roots will grow in yep. and mechanical and compress it down. So when you take it out, you may not, you may put size four <laughs> in. It may be dust by the time you put it in. So if you're putting the small stuff in in about a month, it's It'll be nothing, and you have bought you have bought money and went and gotten yeah. nothing out of it. Well, and then rot, and mm -hmm. your roots will brown. And your roots will brown. Yes. And you had a question. 
Oh, I was just gonna say, um, with the perlite, it's very dusty when you move in the back. Very much so. Wear a mask. Yeah, no, it is similar. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's has very dusty. I, I actually sift all of my uh, perlite because that shit is expensive. So I buy the number four and I sift that over half inch screen. Mm -hmm. That falls into a, a garbage can. I sift that over a, over a quarter inch screen. So I've got now I've got number four, number three. Yes, so I sift it down to the next one. And then at the very end, I sift it to an eighth inch screen. That falls to an eighth inch screen. I use that for my primary plants. This stuff's expensive. I don't waste one little grain. Of or, that stuff. Yeah. And you wear it off the Oh, yeah. I've got a whole dust, I, I've got a whole dust, dust outfit. And I actually have a picture of where the garbage can was. And there's two little spots where my feet were. And the whole rest of the ground is covered in dust. <laughs> and some people will also say to use um, charcoal. That's another charcoal thing. Works. I don't know what the other people will say, but I don't particularly care for charcoal. I have big charcoal. Because charcoal will give you the aeration, yes, yep. but charcoal is a sink for nutrients. Now, some yep. people say it does sink the bad, but it is, it is, it will also to take degree. the good well, to a degree, but it will right. also take the fertilizer, which means you're going to up your fertilizer right. and that's your parts per million. So that's not what you use. To a, well, yeah. also to a point, one of the people, people said, oh, well, I put charcoal in because it, it pull, absorbs the bad stuff. Okay. Uh -huh. It's yeah. not infinite. If, even if, if you put a, activated charcoal like you did in an aquarium It'll and it was pulling point. something out, that's lovely, but it's going to mm -hmm. saturate and stop at some point. I put charcoal in because I'm lazy. Mm -hmm. So I use charcoal, which doesn't break down because it's basically carbon by that point, and perlite and my Orchiata. Um, Orchiata. Isn't the charcoal idea, from endangered hardwood stuff? Uh, it depends on where you're getting it from. Okay. Uh, I'm getting it from Lazari Fuel Company, yeah. and it is oh. Um, they have two sizes, and it's over by um, Brisbane. Right. So I'm, I'm asking. asking I'm, I'm trying to remember, this, about trying remember the source of the, the plant. Um, it's from Mexico, but I forget what it is. I'm getting it from. What's that? Mesquite. Mesquite. There you go. I don't use it, so that's yeah. It's, it's, right you here. know, and it's the sort of thing I'm only using it to hold the space because it doesn't break down. The idea that it's going to absorb. Bad stuff, eh, no, this and, is not an aquarium. Yeah. And there's also coconut husk, but I don't think any of us use it here because it's. Oh, I do. Okay. Well, I, I don't for my, I'm a catlia guy. I breed catlia. So no, I don't, I would never put it. I would never, not in this climate, but when I was in New Mexico, where New Orchids comes from, we put um, we put coconut husk. So it depends on if you're a cymbidium bird. Co um, coconut husk is great for the organic media, but if you're growing catlias, no, unless you're really up towards Sacramento where it gets hot. Well, I also wouldn't change to coconut husk anymore. When people first started using this, I, I've, I've heard too many horror stories so, uh, of people changing everything all at once to a new, oh, this is the latest and greatest thing. I waited till Santa Barbara orchid estates have been growing in this for several years. And I had the advantage, we used to have the plant division table and I would get to divide up the plants that they've been growing for a number of years. So I can see how their roots look without having to put any of my stuff in. They were growing in coconut and it grew wonderfully well. One small problem, like so many sources of potting materials that we use, we screwed that up. Um, what happened is this is made from the husk of the coconut, the part you don't see in the store, the big round basketball sized piece. That's chopped up into small pieces. What has happened is the sudden interest in one, coconut husk, and two, coconut, coconut water. Because ah, yeah. now they're harvested green and that husk has not matured, it's not dried enough. When they chop that up, if you put that in your mix, it's going to rot out in about a year. So unless you really like repotting, I would not switch to coconut husk anymore. I've got to, or even supplement it because I used to do. Oh yeah, it, it just rots out really fast. Yeah. I, I I've got ten year a ten year supply of ten year old stuff, so I'm still running into that. Yes. When I run out of that, I've I've started stocking up on the orchid. Yep. I've got cabinets full. The other thing about coconut husk is that. You have to take the time to rinse it out yes. about yeah. three or four times because when they when they bring it and get them out from the Philippines Sri or Sri Lanka or whatever, they drag all that stuff through the ocean. So yeah. it soaks up all the salts. So you have to rinse it out 
Yeah, I'm sorry to say that. I, I mean, I keep testing it. I feel like I have a wide tail because I measure the smart familiar yep. and there is not that much salt in that stuff. That's probably the 18th century when the British were doing the players, but in the last 10, 20 years, it's fine because I use something of cut and it does not have that much salt. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, it, the whole thing. yeah, I don't measure it. So I just rinse it out just, yeah. and also yeah, because I, was, I wanted to get it would be measured, wet when I plant. I was measuring it. And in my case, I found three soaks is generally enough, but I was getting, the first number was off the charts. That's and then exactly. after that, it would be better. And it after that, out because of the grain are really fast. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, and I, uh, the way I soak my coconut anyway, I put it in a big barrel, so a half a cube in there, let it soak overnight. And then, and then there's the last one, it's just the newest one, probably, or what used to be very popular, but has now come back, is tre is tree ferns. These are giant cycadian tree fern ferns that started to that were back all the way from the Paleozoic date. We, they now in the New Zealands are growing them ecologically so that they don't get damaged. And the thing is, is that it dries yeah. out. <laughs> it dries out about the same as bark, but it holds a lot more moisture, like moss. And yeah. um, and the price of moss from your distributors, if you haven't bought moss recently, it's tripled for oh, us yeah. at the wholesale rate in the last year. So it has now become at parity. Um, and this stuff is, at least it's for me, pH neutral. And it doesn't degrade for 10 years. And I have seen triple the amount of root growth in it. The amount of root growth has tripled. I have I have put 50% across it there. And it just creates a giant solid mass, not of that still aerates, yep. but it makes it so that if you're repotting things like seedlings, upping them a pot every every six months to 18 yeah. months, you take out, you put a new pot, you fill around, your repotting's job is easier when you're a working person like me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, when you're a working guy like me who has a real who has a real job in the universities, yeah. it is time efficiency is important. And one thing you mentioned, and what uh, I should, if you look back in an old book on orchids, up until about the 60s, this is the potting mix. We mm -hmm. called it Osmunda or tree fern. Yeah. Yes. And what happened is we stripped a lot of forest that shouldn't have been stripped right. to get the packing materials. Now, as you mentioned, New Zealand are actually growing it as a renewable source. They're planting them, growing them, harvesting them, shipping them. Okay, that's good to know because I've avoided this stuff. Oh yeah, for the yeah. longest time, it one, was, it was, it, it, once banned. people started uh, stripping the forest, it was banned. You could not get it because people were going out there and, and you know, doing the whole rainforest. Oh, look, we can just strip it to the walls. Yeah. Now they're growing it sustainably, sustainably. Now you can get it legally and feel good about doing it. And I have um, some in stock if anyone needs it. Yeah, and I, 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 the only downside is I wouldn't put a very big plant in it. I no, would, I, I would, I would, anything it's over, expensive. any, if the expense of it, I, I put things up to a five. Once yeah. it's, once it's beyond a five, it's, it's, it's Just there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't have anything in fern tonight. But, but you know, something in this size would be lovely in fern, anything in this size. My paths are loving it. Lovely in fern, all that size. No, the stuff in your windowsill. They sulfurnite, things with sulfurnitis, the sulfurnitis catalyst that like aeration, but also a little thing. Yep. SLCs, bloody love it. I would have been in some videos, but some videos, because some videos take bigger pots. Yeah. Well, I said anything about a five that immediately eliminated yeah. some videos. <laughs> said immediately eliminated. <laughs> Some in a back ball, a single oh, back ball. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. No. 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 Okay. I'm just straight tree. Yeah. 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 You don't have to deal no, with it. You just stuff stuff it in there. If you, like I said, if you go back and find a book from the you know fifties, it's all in a tree for all in Os Osmunda is. On the thing, Osmunda is the root mass, and tree fern is essentially the trunk. Yeah, and, and then you can get it in slab. You can get it in. You've got the broken up stuff, which is I've got, awesome. I've got broken up stuff. I've got I've got yeah. slabs for Bill for Mount King. I ordered a bunch of slabs from him. Well, used to come in like molded things. Oh yeah, used you to be able to get. Yeah. You used to get monkeys and all sorts of. Really things. I have not seen those. I think the problem with those is they have to grow a lot bigger before you can make. Uh, a cylindrical thing like this or a round pot. That takes a lot more years and they are harvesting these a lot sooner. So they're not getting to this big round to be harvested. But the beauty of it is, for example, what I just did with my stand, oh, 
if you wanted something older. I put the you know basic um, one year pot liner mm -hmm. um, um, that you would do for like a hanging basket of right. a fern in there. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put tree fern in it. In a year, that Stan Hopo will root into it in a year or two, and that there I'll just take out the fern liner and the and the tree fern will be a mass enough yeah, that it'll, it'll that'll live for there for the next until I'm old and gray. Until, until it outgrows the pot, you'll have to repot it. Have to cut the pot up. <laughs> yeah. But build this and not let plants um, outgrow no. a pot. No, not, not at all. Does. Not at all. He so bigger. <laughs> just puts it in a bigger pot. Bill's media is the is the fact bulb that decay to grow its own media. <laughs> Bill's, <laughs> Bill's, Bill's media is its own. Plant. Okay. Any yes. next question? Now, the, question on Bill. Is anybody watching to see if there's questions coming in there's, on the? I see eight. I see eight. On, on chat. So maybe the top of one. We have a question while we're getting there. Yes. Any of you guys tried rock wool? The uh, Australians use rock wool a lot. I know that. Um, rock wool. Yeah, I know um, Warren Batchman used to use it. Um, but what's his name? Um, the soccer kindness guy. From oh, Burita. Yeah, uh, Burita Scott Berry. Scott, Scott Berry is using rock wool and perlite. So there's no nutrition. There's no nutrition, nutritional value in it at all. It is a bit alkaline the first time you use it. Um, and it rock wool is what it sounds like. It's essentially fiberglass. I don't even want to do that. But by the same token, somebody gave me a big uh, tote full of it, and I still got it. I just haven't forget what I want to use it with yet. Uh, I tried using my sarcochyla skin. Um, uh, a perlite and pumice mix, and discovered that it was so bright that this that the uh, leaves like it and burned it under the leaves. got burned from the underside. It's like, well, that didn't work out so good. But people do use it, uh, and it's, it will never break down. But again, you have to take one thing into account because it is in completely inorganic. One of the advantages of having an organic component to your mix, well, two advantages. One is something like this this came out this is a rocks that was proposed at one point as a uh, potting mix the salts you get in there will wick to the top the water that wicks to the top when it evaporates it leaves salts on the upper edges of any inorganic material if it's an organic material like say a big chunk of bark or whatever that actually causes it to break down and all that salt breaks off the top on this it doesn't it stays there it stays on the top and the roots hit it and they go, um, that's not good. That's the downside to inorganic because otherwise, how would all go to inorganic? The other side of it too is when your bark or your uh, uh, coconut or whatever, when it breaks down, it does release some nutrients, some tiny little micronutrients you may not be providing. If you're in a completely inorganic mix, you have to provide everything. So it's like growing hydroponic. Is it possible? Yeah. But you got to pay attention. Oh yeah, this this was something that was big for a while. These little coke, these little uh, clay balls. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they found it, uh, yeah. Like, if if you're growing it, it like if you're growing in distilled water, these, these would be fine. I mean, I wouldn't mind growing a carnivorous plant in those because you know they're neutral. Once it, once I rinse them out the first time. But again, I fertilize the daylights out of everything, so and I, I think, would have a problem. With and it. I think the other thing to be Concern of at least that's something I don't know as the other people say is I don't mix types of media. I will mix different size of orchiata, but because things degrade at different levels, I would not put a seedling that I started plug trait moth unless I cleaned it out. Yep. If it's going to stay there, don't start. And you'll see this from some people yep. um, uh, um, uh, there that they'll have they'll start the seedlings of moss there. But then what will happen is you'll have this plug of moss in the center. That will break down quicker, and then, um, and then there. And what you'll do is you'll just rot it from the inside. Right. That same thing goes for even mounting. Only things I only have a few things that I mount with with me with with moss. Yeah. Yeah. Only until it roots there, because plants are lazy. First rule of evolution: laziness always wins. <laughs> so, um, so if you don't work in a good energy, if you don't have to. Um, and so if you're going to mount something or there as well, that just, we, we haven't talked about mounting, but if you're going to put moss on top of there, the plants will go to the much soft moss and root in and never anchor themselves 
to their core, which means you don't have anchoring. You have to keep the anchoring rope or twine or fishing line is what I use to it. And then, and then that moss, especially the sphagnum moss, after about 18 months, it doesn't become soft in there. It becomes a brick. It, uh, it becomes a blunt force trauma weapon. <laughs> it becomes a blunt force trauma now, weapon. I want to mention something too. There's also two different approaches to potting mixes. And one of them is the recipe approach. You know, I was just looking at this like, yeah, this is a recipe. Um, I've, I've gone lazy and I do the, the Bill Weaver. I do the, uh, the simplest thing yeah. is uh, <laughs> at, at most three pieces, three different things. I don't mix, for example, um, there's kind of two major approaches. One is to say, okay, I want it to be just like in nature. So I'm gonna put a little sand and a little of this and a little of that and a little of the other thing. So just like in nature, I go, well, I go to the mechanical approach. Mechanical approach is I need something that will hold the plant up, something that will hold moisture allow calcium ion exchange so that it'll hold the fertilizer and give it to the plant. And more than anything else, promote drainage. That's why when I do my talks, the last thing I always introduce is that thing. <laughs> the most important thing in any mix. Air. Air. So I go with the simplest thing possible. At most three components, one of them is for drainage, one or two is for uh, basically providing the moisture retention and holding the fertilizer and that sort of stuff. But this is the top of the stack. If all else fails, promote a bit more drainage, just have to water it more. Yeah. So one thing, you keep talking about size. Can you give us a guide on what size you use with different plants? Um, if you're looking at, for example, bark, um, I start a small plant in what used to simply be called quarter inch bark, which in Kiwi, Kiwi, they did, they, they did something, uh, uh, Orchiata did something really silly. They used to have sizes, seven, nine and a half. So they decided, oh, we'll finish that. We'll do something even stupider. So the fine bark, instead of being called fine, is now called classic. Uh, then it goes up to um, power, power plus and super. Oh, yeah, yeah. power, power plus and super. So what it boils down and to, and then there's and then there's dust called perfection. perfection. If you use that, you're you're going to have perfectly dead plants. Yeah. You're going to have perfectly <laughs> dead plants. So basically, what you're looking what you're looking at is you're looking to be able to precision. You're waiting for it to drain rapidly through whatever you've got. So if you've got a small pot, you can use a small bark. Uh, if you put a big part, a big pot, and fill it full of this powdery stuff here, it is never going to dry out. It is never going to drain properly, and you're never going to get air out when the water drains out. Um, as an example, people have always said, oh, well, I like my mycelidiums like to be crowded because they bloom really well when they're crowded. No, they bloom really well because they're a big plant. It doesn't, it, it wants good drainage. You could grow it in a giant tub, but it better be super well drained because a big pot will hold too much moisture and the plant can't get it out. It can't drain out and the air can't come in afterwards. So you need to size your potting mix, in my case, uh, bark based on what I'm doing. So if I do a, a four inch pot or one of these small ones, I'll use a fine bark. If I'm growing a slightly larger pot, like a six inch, I'll go to a bark that's probably this big, whether it's called power, power plus, whatever. When I go to my big bowls of uh, plants, I go to what's called super, which is the biggest you can get in any of these. It's like three quarter to one inch. Also bear in mind those big bowls, it's a 20 inch you know, bowl like this. It's only that deep inside. Full pan. Yeah, it's a, it's a big thing like this. But it's only that deep inside because underneath all of that, I put either styrofoam peanuts or upside down net pots so that the bottom of that is air. I only want this much drainage in there. Or like they're on the side of trance, they're, they're crawlers, they're not diggers. Yes. So they, so I like that. I like that. They're not diggers. I love that. Yeah, because when I go for a six inch pot, I'll start with a six inch azalea pot, it's that big. Mm -hmm. When I go to an eight inch pot, my eight inch pot is an eight inch bulb pan. It's also only that deep. My 10 inch pots are only that deep. 
and ball pans are getting notoriously bare. Um, uh, my heart goes out to Mary Garrison when she was closing down in Belize, oh, yeah. and she gave me her collection of ball pans that were no longer in May. Oh, and I, out. I gave her the biggest hug I could possibly I muster. I, yeah. Oh, sorry, Bill. Sorry, Bill. Sorry, Bill. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yes. But the important I part know. out of the whole thing is you want to make sure you have proper drainage. So that's why in a small pot, small bark. Big pot, big bark. Depending on your plant as well. Uh, a, a, yeah, I, would, I was I was gonna say is this it it's not Bill's correct, but I'll add an asterisk. That's general specific. That's For right. example, if it's an SLC or a Pultonar and has there, I downgrade the size. Yeah. If it's a Repeculus lelia, even though it's a smaller plant, I put my Repeculus lelia, my lelia Susanna's, it's in a four inch pot and it's in super. Oh, yeah. And this in December, when it was raining, it was still crying, it was still crying out in just a bay. Yeah. So it is. Zygos and on sense, I would put a size smaller than I would for a catlia. Yes. I do, sorry, I'm a catlia breeder. It's what I grow. Everything is relation, everything is normalized by a catlia. That's my normalization yeah. constant. So it's that's my normalization constant. So that's so it's Bill's correct. I would just say it's genera right. specific or even types of breeding. Is well, 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 types of roots, you know, right. yeah. you have your fine little Marsavani roots. Oh. Yeah, and as an, as an example, in Mazda Valley, you could grow that in a pot this big, but you wouldn't be using the, the super yeah. bark because that doesn't what that isn't what that plant wants. You have to make it appropriate. Yeah, paths and brands I never put beyond power. Right, paths and brands. I, I keep those in in power or the uh, classic. Classic. But I, use classic. A, I use a lot of uh, perlite in my pack. Yeah, my my frags sit in water all the time. Yeah, I do a I do a three to one. I, I normally what I would do for mixtures if you're going to add anything, I like the three rule. I do what Bill does. Uh, my normal thing is uh, three parts of one to one part of whatever you're adding. So I go by scoops, three scoops of bark in the in the in the bark mix, one scoop per light. So I go by and I buy a uh, my scoop is a eight dollar uh, corn feed and uh, scoop for chickens. Thank you. <laughs> so, I have a scoop from um, the pet store. So well, yeah. there you go. Now, here's, there a question, you go. here's a question that came up. Can you also wet your perlite in the larger bag and then scoop a smaller amount into a sealed container, which you can keep wet so you don't have as much dust, still wear a mask while doing the first process? I would always wear a mask when doing any of my mixing. If you do get it wet and it will keep the dust down when you're working with it, if the other problem with it, I found out that if, if you get them, them wet and they sometimes the bag comes wet, uh, you got to cover it in something or algae starts growing oh, in the so bag. Like, yeah. Stuff growing in it. yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah. So uh, also, also perlite is mostly air. That's why if you float the old, you know, think about your old middle school experiments, perlite mm -hmm. slips on water. You wet that sucker. You just did four cubic pounds of bag that you wetted. Good luck with back pain. Good luck with back pain. Also, it should be noted. You just spray it. Yeah, just you it spray it with noted. some water and then yeah, take out what exactly. you need. Keep the dust down. It should be Top, noted. So it can't get in there and then keep going. Perlite does not hold water. Perlite is not a sponge. Perlite is what they call a closed cell foam. So all the little bubbles that are made in, the, in there, while they are up next to each other, they don't have openings between them. A, an open cell foam is like your sponge. You put water here and it soaks all the way up through all the little bubbles in the foam. Perlite doesn't do that. That's why when you dump it into a pot, it floats and it will float forever because the bubbles can't let water in. It'll hold a little moisture on the outside, but its main purpose, purpose yeah, is aggregate to make some elbow room. Um, and as she was talking about, I, I showed her this. This is what perlite looks like before they throw it into a furnace at 6,000 degrees and it blows up like popcorn. It's just glass. So be careful of the dust. It is nasty stuff. Yeah, I, I put uh, perlite with the fine bar I used to in my sedation. Yep. But then perlite, you can't, uh, you have to dispose of it. You can't recycle it because the perlite is in. 
I think of the pilot, if I'm looking at, uh, well, I'm not going to recycle it at home because um, I'm worried about virus. I don't really have a problem with putting perlite in like my green waste bin. I think of it as putting dirt in there because perlite just grinds up like any other you can soil compost it. But, but you can compost it. What's that? It's inorganic. Well, right, but so is, so is half of your dirt components. Yeah. Sand, just any of the rocks, any of the smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, it'll keep breaking down and get crushed as they, they chip it up. But by the same token, I would never, ever reuse your really? potting no, mix. Yeah, yeah, I, I figured you didn't, but I wanted to make that. For point. those people who are new to growing orchids, do not reuse your mix. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because you don't know what's little critters or bugs or whatever. Virus. Is that, virus. virus. Well, yeah, hopefully you test your plants for virus. Some, people don't, some people don't care. They think I just want to no, grow my plants. But most, most of us test our, our plants at least when they're like you're but that's because you're a seller. Right. Um, okay. Um well, I'm gonna hand me that little thing right that little stack of pictures. This is my favorite little um, this is demonstration. My demonstration stuff I got. There's here is oh and it's great since COVID. Yeah. Uh, because people are familiar with these little okay. test strips. Yeah. You familiar with those little pictures? You know, little COVID you ever tested yourself for, for oh. COVID? Yeah, it's the same technology, but for orchids. Now, the difference is you don't have a nose you can stick a swab up in. And you will not catch orchid viruses. Yes. <laughs> I had to explain that to that's, a colleague. That's not a problem. <laughs> so I had to explain that to a colleague. What, 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 you, what, what you do with the orchid is you cut up a piece of the leaf, you grind it up, you put it in the same little, little vials that you got for the original uh, COVID testing, and you stick a strip in it. And it does the same thing. It says, you, you know, solution, though, right, true. but it's a little vial. Yeah. And it's like, you know, this virus, that virus, yes, the test was good. Now, why do we care? Well, if you, if your plant has a virus, it's like your plant has a cold. The difference is it will never get over the cold. It cannot be cured. So this plant, not virus, virus. So you're growing that plant and trying to make these lovely flowers and you get fat. Or in cymbidiums, this one should have been a nice velvety red. That's what happened to the flower. And, and virus will spread. Yes. A, 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 a orchid viruses, the best way I can describe them is they're like STDs, it's fluid to fluid contact. <laughs> um, so, so the problem with keeping virus plants in Rip water runs through, water wicks across the bench, and every neighbor near it that it's touched. Now, of course, that's the biggest why the dividing is the most crucial part. Divisions are when you're there, you're cutting it, it will go airborne. And, and that is also why I don't double bench and, anymore because the water goes through and runs down. Right. And so that's and, that, and, that. as Florence was mentioning, if you've got one or two orchids, okay. eh. Who cares? If you're not going to bring it to a show or heaven forbid make it to bring it to a meeting, you don't need to necessarily go out and buy right viruses. Right in her house, virus, his, all his plants were virus. Yeah. They're still alive because people keep them. Because they came from him. They came from him, but they keep it separated from their clean plants. Right. Yeah. Though I had and one from his nursery and it was virus. I threw some bitch out. I kept the tag. Yeah, because it there, was from Raymond Burr for heaven's sake. And there is, and there, and plant away. And the commercial breeders will often have a virus greenhouse or a virus bend because they're still they're still good for breeding. But you must use them as a pod parent because you because the pollen grains themselves green, are not virus. No, you have no oh, green dry pot. Dry pot it. Dry pot it. Don't and worry. And watch it. And and there. <laughs> so, yeah. Unless you're unless you're gonna unless you're gonna hybridize. But the, the, yeah, the yeah, point yeah, about, yeah. about virus is that it will spread to your plants and everybody has virus. Yeah. Yeah. You That's can't right. tell whether your plant is virus unless you test it. I can, now that I've been testing enough, I can guess yeah. that, oh, this one looks like it's virus. And sure enough, it's virus. But then there's one that has no symptoms at all. And I'm going, oh, it's a great plant. Then I find out it's virus. The first time I found a plant, had a plant that was virus, it killed me to oh, yeah. throw it away. 
So you have a choice. You keep it and put it somewhere six miles away from the rest of your plant collection, or, or you it. toss it. Burn it up. Burn well, it. And I, um, uh, fire, I tested before the recent Peninsula show. I had four plants I was going to bring, one of them was virus. And people said, well, Audrey said, well, where is it? And I opened the lid to the garbage can. There. <laughs> Had a wonderful flower. It's like, oh my God, I wanted that. I snapped the flower off and gave it to one of the ladies that works out there and that it was plentiful. Now you had a question? Well, so this is kind of vibration. Can you talk also about when you would repot and why you would repot? Oh my goodness. Oh, that is why well, yeah. well, yeah. the, the most important part about that is the um, why. Because when you're putting a plant in a pot, some part of it is going to be organic and it's going to break down. So that nice drainage you had is soon going to be filled up with broken down components of what you had in there. As an example, you said you put it in the fine stuff, it's going to turn to mush in a year. Yeah. If it turns to mush, it's going to not have the drainage and your roots are going to drown. That's more plants are killed from overwatering than underwater. Now, when you repot, Oh my God, that's a mess. Because phalaenops, and uh, what is it, paths and frags don't give a damn. Bifoliate cattleyas, so give a damn. If a damn. you pot that at the wrong year, it will sulk or it's just going to die. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it all depends yeah. on the plant. Uh, and the bifoliates will sort of a spike right in there and will not there. And I just think, well, it's two, two leaves on each side. It's a plant giving me the middle finger for yeah. potting it the last time of the year. So, so the, the deal about repotting is some of the stuff you want to think about is has the media broken down? That's why people like Gorgiata because it doesn't break down. It takes fast. longer. But the problem is then is that the plant grows huge and it starts to fall over the sides. So obviously when you have the plant growing out of its pot, you need to repot. Yeah. And then you have, depending on the media, there are plants that like sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss needs, plants need to be repotted yearly. So same thing with uh, path cypripediums also yes. need to be repotted. Yes, so that's in practice every year. Yep. That's in practice so every it, year. It depends on whether you like this plant and you want to take the time to repot every year. Or like me, there's been, I grow mainly cymbidiums. And some of my cymbidiums, as I've been repotting, I looked at the tag and it says 2015. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, I haven't repotted it forever. Yep. <laughs> so you know it all depends and all the time you have and how much time you want but you do want to repot mostly when plants have gotten too big although bill lets the plant fall down on his yeah. on his bench and he yeah. says oh there are pieces and i will put those pieces in another yeah. job bill let the divide itself yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Or you have plants like cymbidiums who like to be repotted because they outgrow their pots. So you repot them usually every three to four years, maybe sooner. Yeah. It depends on, again, your media. Yeah. Um, or the plants don't like their roots getting to surf like dendrochylums, which is yeah. why something that doesn't break down for a while is there. And then yeah. you also have some other cymbidiums, the Asian cymbidiums, the little tiny ones that are the Gorinchia and all that. Expensive ones. Yeah, you know, they need to be repotted every year, and then you don't break up the, the um, you don't roots. cut the roots off of those because they grow straight down. If you cut them, you've killed that root. Yeah, they, they don't die. branch. They don't, they don't, they don't branch. branch. So there's a lot of things when you buy a plant, you need to come to the come to meetings, talk to the to the experts, which I am not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, she does one they, thing really well. She does one thing really well. Wait a minute, that's so the one of the things like those sparks and I. <laughs> and but you talk to a lot of people you look up on, on the websites to find out what is there and you learn from reading so many different websites who is reliable and who is not and it's hard yeah, who's full of shit? yeah. yeah well and, that, and he said that i did and that's the point as well that orchids don't like their roots getting disturbed as we all know just and as you said, you know, if the plant is growing out the side, those roots are healthy, but they're they they've been conditioned to grow in air. Yeah. Which means you take those air roots and put them in bark. They're not dead roots, right. they're so not they're not happy. 
And so another thing is, and if you know the media, for example, you wait until it puts up new root tips. Right. Until uh, wait till the root tips get half an inch long. You, do it all once you're you can put them you in can there. still put them in there. They may or may survive, but you'll have a higher dead off percentage. Right. That's also why you, if you know, for example, orchiata, it breaks down two two and a half years. That's why you want to repot it so that the plants near the back of the pot push it all. Actually, I literally push my cattleyas. I compress it with a good amount of force. If it's an old growth, not a new growth, those things are brittle like glass. Yeah. But they um, but you do it so that it can walk two years worth of growth before it walks out. Also, then I when I know it's walking out, I know it's about two and a half years. I know the bark's there, so I also know when to time to go. It's time to go. So I synchronize my potting so I have a big enough pot where it's not overpotted and has two years worth of growth. Yep. The, the plant will all grow in there and the bark will there. It gives me three, it gives me three telltale signs that it needs repotted because when you have uh when you have uh, 12,000 seedlings coming in a year, yeah. you will not write that on a tag because I will get carpal tunnels. So the plant needs to tell you in multiple ways yeah. and that multiple faults. <laughs> the other thing about repotting, usually you will repot after they have bloomed because you want to enjoy the bloom, or you can cut the bloom with a new sterile or clean razor blade. Sterile. Put, yes. sterile. It was sterile. I'll say sterile. Yeah. And then you can put that in, in you know, in water to enjoy in your house. But you don't want to take your pruning shears and go, I like that one, and then I like that one, and then I like that one. And she wear gloves. Wear gloves. I don't normally wear, well, I don't cut my, I leave my, my cymbidiums to grow naturally and then they, they die yeah. off. I wear them. gloves during repotting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gloves. We wear gloves and change them out. Well, he's going back to covering the concept of virus again. Um, as he pointed out, um, viruses in orchids are spread by the same way that uh, COVID and STDs are spread, they're spread by us. So, yeah. Contact. Yeah. And, that's, <laughs> and that's also why I virus test every plant that I'm going to divide because also if it is virus, and I made this mis and I made a mistake once, I'll admit my mistake, is um is I did it and then I I had I repot in a in a bark tray and I realized that plant was virus mm -hmm. and bark stays and, and virus can stay on bark for up to a year or more. And so I had to drop $50 of bark down, down the Greenways bin. Mm -hmm. And this was in New Mexico. It was free that this, this was there. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I'm young enough to do most of your branches. Also, I understand. Also, I understand, understand that. Also understand, well, I wouldn't, that would have been a fire. I wouldn't think that would be good enough. Um, bear in mind that even though there are virus tests, virus tests are, they have, they say, have the same fallibility yeah. as your COVID test. Until you've got enough viral load built up in your plant, it won't necessarily show up. Now they are still extremely sensitive, and that's why uh, you know if you look at it, it's like it, it's got kind of shows. yeah, it's got one stripe here, and you go well, it's 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 kind of got that line where it says it's got the virus. It's like okay, that's by like being a little bit pregnant. Okay, <laughs> yeah. if it shows a little bit there. It's virus. And that's why some people will say, oh, to cut down on the cost, because the virus test groups have gone up because of the, especially during COVID, yep. the same media there. I mean, virus groups, they used to say $5 a test kit. Yep. They are now, if you now buy them, they're six, seven wholesale. If you need, if you don't want to buy 25 of them to get the better rate, which right. costs $125, which is $10 now, is theirs, is, um, is there and so some people will say oh put five six different plants in one strip but he said viral load which means if you put uh, six clean and one virus you may wash it out so yeah. one one kit one plant but the good yeah. thing is, is that there's new ones what the taiwanese have been doing with the oh, virus testing yeah. there those are almost now half the price and we've yeah. just got some in and that will at least save you some money i just got yeah. 100 of those and they're, they're lovely yes. if, if we did, I, I have a theory that yeah. we don't have that much time. Can we switch to fertilizer a little oh, bit? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a whole oh, oh my goodness. Thing. But there's one thing we haven't talked about is pot is, is our pots. Well, let's let's, let's, so let's, there's, let's there's quickly, a lot of stuff. Let's quickly touch on fertilizer. Yeah. yeah. You've got the NPK that is on the label. Nitrogen, now, phosphorus, 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 phosphorus. Phosphorus. 
those are the macronutrients that all plants need. Among, uh, after that, you have micronutrients. So you have magnesium, calcium, copper, boron, blah, 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 blah. blah. There are as many fertilizer mixes as there are orchid growers. Now, what uh, Mitch was describing, uh, the 515, 5, 15, 515 CalMag is what uh, Romeo sells in 50 pound bags that a lot of the orchid growers use the commercial ones because it gives you uh, the two outside numbers high, the middle number small. Uh, there was a speaker at one of our meetings who had done experiments and found if you make that middle number anything um, below 2% or above 5%, it actually inhibits flower growth. And that's the one everybody goes, oh, I want a really big flower for flat. No, no, that's, that's not good. Um, there was a guy from uh, Michigan State who did a whole series of papers. Did thesis on it. Oh, oh my goodness. He wrote six different papers on the media, the fertilizer, all of this stuff. If you really want to understand that you have no idea what you're doing, read his six papers. And you may not even understand this. Yeah, but it's, it's, they, are, they are journal papers, so oh they do goodness. cram PhD level notes by okay. understand. You know, and they're, and they're out there. Uh, basically, uh, he made one uh, that they basically gave the name Michigan State to it. Michigan State formula. MSU. 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 And it's uh, 18425 or something like that. Um, and in this area, I mean, I get a half a ton of half a ton of it made every year because, well, I got a lot of plants. And um, then he sells it to other people. Then I sell it to other people. Uh, the big thing in 25 pound bags, uh, yeah. the big thing about it is anything the plant doesn't use is going to wash out or stay in the bark or stay in the bark as a salt. So there's a downside and an upside. I, uh, uh, Ken just buys uh, Miracle Grow yeah. and puts it in his mix. And again, he's using um, just a generic mix and a generic fertilizer. Anything you use, the plant will use what it needs and everything will wash just out. Just make sure it's water soluble. Yes. Sure. Yeah. I, I just want to make sure because I keep hearing that there is never have been, there were never will be an orbit fertilizer. That's marketing. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's just wasting your money. Yeah. So yeah. Just fertilizer, fertilizer, fertilizer. Different compounds have higher nitrogen, potassium, or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. if you buy fertilizer or one of the purple bottles, bottles. Yeah. the one in the purple bottles. Oh, yeah. Or the, the ones yellow, or, or the, the blue, the pink and, and the blue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Waste of money. When I started, it was pink and blue. So you use the pink stuff, which was a 0 30 30 when it was in vegetative growth, and then you use the 6 20 20 when it was in. Floor when it initiates all flowers, but if you got more than one plant, that doesn't work. So I started just using the 2020 20, and I'm using some Michigan State stuff because I'm late. Whenever you guys have to eat out, think about yeah, what it is. Think about what it is. Yeah. In nature, they don't say, oh, it's going to rain now with more compact. Let me see that. It'll use what it needs to use, and the rest will either build up as salt or wash out. And have you got a question? What is Miracle Grow originally formulated by KLS? I have absolutely I no idea. I don't know that one. It, that might have been because the Miracle Grow has a bunch of different ones. Uh, for a while, I was spraying mere acid yeah. on um, uh, as a foliar feed for some of my carnivores. But now I got this seaweed stuff that works better, so I use that instead. Um, she doesn't doesn't bring up the uh, total solids. Always talk all night. And, and yeah. there is. Yeah. 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 Folks. Yeah, people look at people are leaving. So well, no, it's a lot of very engaged, but I think well, it, 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 it might be good to take a time check and just talk to folks. Well, what do we Adam was gonna say like we, we actually may have another spot at table to pick up and yeah. visit it again? Yeah. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do all the other stuff we got to do and then we'll just talk around and yeah. hang out afterwards? Let let people get the raffle out of the way yeah. and then uh <laughs> then we'll hang out and talk. Yeah, so we can always talk, but just thinking like you know, we Wrapping have up. an open spot the calendar. Oh, yeah, month yeah. after next in April. I will be here. Oreo, uh, <laughs> so yeah. it's good to come back. And... Well, yeah, we uh, use, we have stuff like pieces, three quarters of people at Answer the Survey said they were sick. Do not, do not. Sorry, really, quick. No. this is really important. 
If you're going to reuse pots, they need to be cleaned and sterilized with bleach or whatever. Do not just use them again. Yeah. Because again, it's virus you have to worry about. If one plant is virus, the next one's going to get virus. That's why she'd mentioned, oh, do you want to use pots? Well, I don't have time to clean and sterilize them to my Standard. yeah. standards. Yeah. Uh, I will just buy new pots. It's, it's expensive, uh, but I still am cheap, so I stack up the used pots. I, maybe when I'm 80, I'll have time to I wash them. mine. <laughs> yeah. 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 Three okay. yeah. Oh, I've got stacks. Okay. Of okay. Pots. Sorry, Adam. No, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. People in the room, can we keep talking to them? If one, they're willing, have fun. Uh, we're going to say goodnight to people online. Okay. Bye. We'll do raffle. And uh, hope to see you all in two and a half weeks. Bye. 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 Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you all. Oh, goodness. Over, <laughs> overflowing. And I have the <laughs> um, I was a middle child. Yeah, on the whole thing. Yeah, the, whole thing. the roots may survive, they may not survive, but the likelihood of the ones that are going outside.